Hello and welcome to Writing with Steve, with me Steve Evans. Before we start, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our channel. Today we're looking at the poem Envy by Mary Lamb. I have it here, so let's go through it. This rose tree is not made to bear the violet blue, nor lily fair, nor the sweet mignonette. And if this tree were discontent, or wish to change its natural bent, it all in vain would fret. And should it fret, you would suppose, it ne'er had seen its own red rose, nor after the gentle shower had ever smelled its rose's scent, or it could ne'er be discontent with its own pretty flower. Like such a blind and senseless tree, as I've imagined this to be, all envious persons are. With care and culture, all may find some pretty flower in their own mind, some talent that is rare. Okay, let's go through the poem stanza by stanza. Let's look at the main themes and the poetic techniques that Mary Lamb is using to communicate her message. The poet compares envy to a rose tree. The rose tree wishes for the beauty of other flowers like the violet and the mignonette and is ignorant to its own beauty. And this seems rather foolish. So looking at stanza one, it says, and if this tree were discontent or wish to change its natural bent, it's all in vain would fret. So the speaker is saying, wishing for change and to be like other trees and other flowers is just an empty wish because it's a wish that can never be fulfilled. So it's no use fretting about being something that you cannot be. That's just all in vain. And again, we've got a pod on the word vain, haven't we? The two meanings of vain. Vain meaning vanity, to wish to be beautiful or to measure your own worth just by your physical appearance. And vain meaning unachievable. So the speaker is saying the rose tree cannot change its nature. And then the speaker also makes the next point that not only is it vain to wish to be like others, by doing this, you miss the beauty that is in you. And the rose tree being so focused and obsessed on the attributes of other flowers and trees completely misses its own beauty and unique attributes. So, for example, the speaker tells us about the rose tree's pretty red flowers and its beautiful scent, perfume. And the speaker says, if the rose tree could smell its own scent, it would never be discontent. And the speaker uses senseless in two meanings. Senseless as in the tree does not use its sense of smell because if it did it would realize how beautiful it smelled senseless meaning stupid because the rose tree is being really stupid to wish to be something it can never be and missing its own unique qualities like such a blind and senseless tree as i've imagined this to be all envious persons are. And now the speaker moves on because her observation of the tree leads her to make a comparison between it and envious people. Like the rose tree, envious people are also blind to their own talents and senseless, being really stupid lacking sense in wishing to be something that they're not. Not only this, 
they are missing their own unique talents and skills and should be focused and proud of these instead. And to reinforce this point, the speaker places this message at the very end of the poem for emphasis. She writes, with care and culture all may find some pretty flower in their own mind, some talent that is rare. And the message the speaker is delivering in those last lines is that people, instead of wasting their time and energy wishing to be somebody else, could spend all that valuable time in working at becoming something that they can be proud of. So the word culture in those final lines has the meaning of agriculture, to grow and to nurture, to grow and nurture their own skills and talents. This poem links really well with A Poison Tree by William Blake. If you haven't checked out our video on A Poison Tree, don't forget to do so. So let's look at some of those comparisons with William Blake's poem. So one noticeable comparison is the use of an extended metaphor. If you remember in William Blake's poem, the idea of anger was expressed in a tree, a poisonous tree that was growing. Also, as in Blake's poem, the purpose of the poem is to teach a life lesson as the poem contains wisdom. Like Blake's poem, it is written in the first person. It uses the word I've and also uses the second person you, which makes a direct connection between the poet speaker and the audience. So the speaker is speaking directly and delivering her message to the reader. Also, because it's written in the first person, it suggests that perhaps Mary Lamb has been envious of others at some point. So she is speaking from her own experience, which gives an added depth and richness to the poem. And let's look at the structure of the poem. Like a poison tree, it has a simple structure. There's a clear rhythm using two four beat lines. And this gives it a nursery rhyme quality. If you remember from Blake's poem, which also used the same technique, nursery rhymes are how we teach lessons to children. Also, they are a great way to remember important lessons. The language, Lexis, is mostly simple in both poems. So as many people can read and understand her message. Mignonette is an uncommon word and that's probably the most difficult word in this poem. And yet its use gives an exotic quality to the poem and really reinforces this wish of someone else's beauty that an envious person would wish to have or wish to emulate. Notice how the poet uses personification to make the link between the rose tree and envious people. She says that the rose tree is discontent. As you know, personification is a technique where we ascribe human qualities to inanimate, unliving things. And the poet also uses the simile like to reinforce that connection between the envious rose tree and envious people. Like such a blind and senseless tree as I've imagined this to be, all envious persons are. However, there are some differences between Blake's poem and Lamb's poem. 
The ending, for example, the ending of A Poison Tree is very ambiguous. We really don't know the position of the speaker in the poem because he uses the word glad at the end. However, the message in Lamb's poem is very clear and very certain. And in fact, the connection between Lamb and Blake is even stronger because both were contemporaries. They lived at the same time in history. In fact, William Blake, we know he was an illustrator, an engraver. He actually illustrated pages of a book that Mary Lamb and her brother Charles wrote called Tales from Shakespeare. And Mary, together with her brother Charles, wrote many stories for children, which again adds to the theme of this poem being instructional. So we can see how in this poem, using a nursery rhyme structure would be appropriate for the audience this is aimed at. Although of course, this is also aimed for the children's parents as well. And as I've said in earlier videos, researching the writer and finding out about their life often sheds some more light and helps you when it comes to analysing their work. Mary Lamb's life was difficult and challenging. She suffered from mental illness and was often placed in institutions which were unpleasant places especially as the view at the time was that mental illness was a sign of sin and low morals. Mental illness was seen as God's punishment. For Mary, this stigma was compounded in 1796, when during a period of mental instability, she killed her mother. Despite these terrible events, she lived long and with her brother Charles wrote stories and poems for children. This might explain why envy sounds like a nursery rhyme. And why the research is really important here is that this poem is extremely reflective and contemplative. The speaker in this poem has thought long and hard about the subject of envy. So the tone of the poem is calm and measured. And the wisdom in this poem has been derived from Mary's challenging circumstances and her own personal experiences, which gives added depth to the message that this is the voice of experience. Let's look at how the poet achieves this calm, measured message. So looking at the structure of the poem, as I said, it's very thoughtful and reflective. It's measured as though it's been written after much reflection and experience of life. So it's calm and measured tone is reinforced by the structure, which develops the speaker's thoughts. The logic of her argument is based on observation. The poem starts this rose tree, and this triggers her reflection on envy and human nature. Her measured argument is reinforced by ending the first stanza with fret, and using fret again in the first line of the second stanza. She uses repetition to reinforce the point she is making. Discontent, for example, and she uses humour to make her points interesting and engaging. So like senseless, she uses the word bent as a pun because it has two meanings. Bent means a talent or a skill, 
but it also means bent as in crooked and leaning over like the trunk of a tree, the trunk of a rose tree. This measured and logical approach is continued through the development, the journey within the poem. So for example, stanza one presents us with the rose tree and what it lacks. Stanza two, however, presents the reader with the rose tree's own talents, its lovely scent and pretty red flowers. Stanza three then makes the comparison between the tree that pities itself for what it hasn't got and with envious people. The poet ends the stanza with the lesson the reader is to take. What we nowadays might call the takeaway, the bottom line, and she literally uses the bottom line that we should take this message home with us. The message being, with care and culture all may find some pretty flower in their own mind, some talent that is rare. And again, that use of a structured rhyming pattern reinforces the message and makes the message easier for the reader to remember. I hope you found this video helpful and don't forget to check out our earlier videos. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe and hit the like button. Until next time, from Carol and me, write well.